Good evening, everyone. Hi there. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Make sure thumbs up if you can. <laughs> Great. So hi, everyone. Those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Rob Torb. I'm the director of the Malky Foundation UK. Thanks very much for joining tonight's music event in collaboration with the Jewish Music Institute. You are in for a really interesting discussion with two leaders in their field. Before we get on to the event, I would just like to say a big thanks to our sponsor, Event Merchandising. Your support is very much appreciated. I would also like to thank Jenny and Gil from the JMI for collaborating with us, and you will get to hear from one of them at the end of the event. Finally, I would like to thank our two guest speakers, Harvey Goldsmith and Michael Grade. They have both been superb in helping to get this event organized. Before I introduce our speakers, tonight is in honor of not just one, but two great causes. The Jewish Music Institute is the home of Jewish music in the UK. They are dedicated to the celebration, preservation and development of the living heritage of Jewish, mu Jewish music for the benefit of people of all ages and backgrounds. Their goal is to inform and inspire audiences with an exciting original program of live performances, educational events and collaborative projects and to, to support musicians playing Jewish music across the UK, enabling them to preserve, preserve this traditional heritage, create new work and reach the widest audiences. And the Malky Foundation, who empowers families of children with severe disabilities in Israel by providing them with therapy and equipment to live independent lives. I have been with the Malky Foundation for three years now, and I have seen firsthand how this small charity makes such a massive impact on the hundreds of families we have supported over the years. Through supporters like yourselves, we have been able to provide consistent therapy to, to severely disabled children, which has given some children the ability to lift a cup of water themselves and other children the capability to walk for the very first time. Now, like so many other charities, COVID has had a big impact on the Malky Foundation, both here in the UK and in Israel, with all our live events and challenges, challenges being cancelled. Fortunately, we have been keeping things going by putting on events such as these. We get daily requests from families asking for help and we are not able to help everyone. So our waiting list is unfortunately growing and growing. But with, but with your support from events like this and hopefully beyond, we will be able to help more severely, severely disabled children in Israel. So from myself and everyone at the Malky Foundation and JMI, thank you very much. Now, on to our first special guest, Harvey Goldsmith. Harvey is one of the world's best known music industry impresarios. He is a legendary and visionary producer and has, and has not only worked with most of the world's major artists, but was responsible for two of the world's largest ever music events, Live Aid and Live Eight. Harvey is considered by many as the man who can take a musician and make them a legend. For the majority of his career, Harvey has averaged around 500 concerts a year, promoting successful tours with the most, if not all, of the world's major artists, including, including Black Sabbath, Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, Eric Clapton, The Rolling Stones, to, to name just a few. Harvey also played a significant role in providing a home for live music by establishing major world venues, such as the transformation of the Millennium Dome into the now world-renowned O2 Arena, and has produced shows with attendance surpassing the 100,000 mark. Harvey is not only a giant in the music industry, but also in the entertainment industry. In 1994, he commenced a relationship with the Cirque du Soleil. This has been one of the most successful shows ever to perform in the UK, returning to London's Royal Albert Hall year after year. Harvey has received numerous awards, including a CBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List and the Diamond Award for his contrib contribution to the arts. A true legend who has had some incredible encounters of the years, which has led to some incredible stories that you couldn't make up. And now our second very, very special guest, Michael Gray. Michael has had a long career in broadcasting, encompassing London Weekend Television, the BBC, ITV, as well as over nine years as Chief Executive of Channel 4 Television. In May 2004, he was appointed chairman of the BBC, succeeding Gavin Davies. Resigning in November 2006, when his appointment as executive chairman of ITV was announced, a post he relinquished in 2009. Michael was non-executive chairman of Pinewood and Shepparton Film Studios for 16 years. He is non-executive chairman of Infinity Creative Media, the production company 12 Town, and also of Reach for Entertainment, a media and entertainment marketing company. Michael is co-founder of The Great Linnet Company, which produces for the theatre. He is chairman of the Aurora's Group Heathrow Expansion Advisory Board. And in January 2001, he became the Conservative peer, Lord Grade of Yarmouth. We are thrilled and grateful to have both these amazing guests with us tonight. And I hope you all enjoy this evening. We will have some time for questions at the end. So please write these down in the text field and we will try and get to you. 
And now over to Michael and Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for that audition. We'll let you know. <laughs> of course. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful to see so many people turned up this evening. Um, there must be nothing on television tonight. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> waiting for the football to start. Um, there's a new Yiddish word. I don't know whether you've come across it yet. That's emerged from the lockdown uh, uh, year and a bit, and that is oiske zoomed. In other words, we've had too many Zoom calls, but this is in such a good cause. And for me, it's a particular pleasure, A, to show my credentials as one of the founder supporters of uh, JMI, uh, and, uh, but mostly to uh, rekindle my association and friendship with Harvey, who is one of the, uh, one of the icons of the, of the producing and entrepreneurial sector of, 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 of the entertainment industry. Now, let me tell you immediately that my efforts in the theater, you know, two and a half thousand seats is a lot of seats to sell for a musical. For Harvey, two and a half thousand, he goes machula. Uh, he's, <laughs> he, he's into, he's into five, 12, 20, 40, 50,000 kinds of people. I'm gonna tell you one story about one of my earliest memories of Harvey he invited me very kindly to a concert he was promoting at Earl's Court, which was Bob Dylan, uh, in God knows when, in 1900 and frozen to death. And not only did he invite me to the concert, which was sensational, of course, one of my heroes, Bob Dylan, but he said to me, would I like to have dinner at San Lorenzo afterwards with Bob Dylan? How could you say no? How could you say it? so? We I turn up at San Lorenzo, and bless him, Harvey puts me next. There's a big table, about 10, 12 people, and he puts me next to Bob Dylan. And I sat next to Bob Dylan for two hours. He never said a word to me, <laughs> to Harvey, to the waiter, to anybody. So I'm not sure that that was a privilege or a penance, uh, but it was memorable. It goes on the <clears throat> list of of geniuses that I've met, from Elvis to Jimmy Durante to Joe Loss, to you name it, people I've met. Uh, but that was a great, that was my earliest memory. Anyway, I'm delighted to say that Harvey and I have been working for the last, how many years, Harvey, with, with Live Aid and Band Aid? 30 years, nearly? 37. 37 years. We have been trustees uh, of Bob Geldof's original Live Aid Band Aid Trust which is the bit of the charity that dishes out the money to, to the starving and the underprivileged in Africa. So Harvey, should we just start with Live Aid? Okay. Because how you lived through that, I'll never know, because that was the most Meshuggah event in, in the history of show business. In my, I was kind of on the fringe. We were only, I was at the BBC. We were just televising, and that was the easiest. <clears throat> but you, you had... The, how did you get involved in the first instance? Well, before I tell you that, um, I just want to follow on with your dinner story at San Lorenzo. Um, Bob Geldof told me the funniest story ever that he was in New York. He got invited by Bob Dylan to join him and Van Morrison um, at Michael's Restaurant in New York. It's a very famous restaurant in, in uh, 55th Street, New York. And uh, the story goes that he, uh, Bob didn't know what to wear and he's bussing around, getting really excited. He's quite nervous, pitches up for the dinner, sits down. They're there for two hours. Not one person said one word. <laughs> Bob tried to make a conversation. All of a sudden at the end of the dinner, Van gets up and said, great night, fabulous dinner. Love to see you guys. And he left. <laughs> Bob gets up and said, oh, I really enjoy talking to you, got up and left, and Bob got stuck with the bill. <laughs> <laughs> you ask him, next time. He, I mean, he tells it much better than I can, but it's hysterical. And that he, has he, absolutely the ring of truth about it, that story. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, Bob's a, he is a character. Uh, 
I'll just tell you one other quick story about Bob Dylan. Um, I got very, actually, strangely enough, very friendly with him over the years. And it started off at the last waltz, uh, which is a very famous TV special that was made. It was the band's last concert. And Mar Martin Scorsese shot a film of it, which you can get. And um, uh, that's really how I met Bob. But um, he, over the years, um, we just seem to hit it off. So uh, I won't regale you with lots of stories, but the, the one that is the killer, we went to see him at Wembley when he was in a low period. And he was playing with the band. He had a hoodie on. You couldn't see him. Half the time he wasn't facing the audience. And the place was sold out completely, blah, 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 blah. And um, about three quarters of the way through, my Diane, my wife and I got up and went home because we'd had enough and we were a bit disappointed we go home we're living in St John's Wood and um, um, at about quarter past one in the morning the phone rings and it's Bob Dylan's security man Jim and Jim says Harvey where are you so I said I'm in bed I'm asleep he said well Bob wants to see you so <laughs> I said it's quarter past one. Where is he? He said he's at the Mayfair Hotel. He said, can you come down and see because he's waiting for you. I thought, oh, my goodness. I get dressed. I drive into town. It's now two o'clock. And um, somehow he kept the bar open. There was only him in the bar, in the corner. You had to really look around to find him. And he's sitting there. And he sits down. And he said, I, I sit down. So, hello, Bob. How are you? He said, yeah, great. He said, I saw you leave the concert. I said, don't be ridiculous. There were 11,000 people there. He said, I saw you and your wife get up and leave. I said, I can't believe it. I said, well, if you want the honest truth, it wasn't your finest concert. Anyway, we started talking whatever, and he's kind of mumbling around. And then he said to me, um, how much does Eric Clapton play as musicians? I said, clearly a dance site more than you do. <laughs> and this is how the conversation went. And we sat up talking till four o'clock in the morning. And um, and that that was, you know, it was just such a funny thing. But he really said he saw, saw myself and my wife get up and leave the concert with 11,000 people. <laughs> Unbelievable. So that was my penance. So interesting. Live Aid. Interesting. Um, in interesting that he cared that you'd left. Yes, that's that's the interesting bit of that story. It says yeah, a lot of absolutely. says a lot about Bob Dylan. Well, he was, you know, we had we've we've had some good times together. That's for sure. Well, even since that night at the Mayfair Hotel. Yeah, yeah. I don't I'm work sure. with him anymore because he changed managers, and the manager works with somebody else, and that was it. But I do see him, and whenever I see him, he's always friendly. I'm one of the very few because most people with most people he just hides he just doesn't yeah 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 so but anyway let's come back to light i'm just going to turn the light on because i'm uh, I'm, get, I'm sitting here in natural light i've just realized carry on carry on Art. so live aid um 1985 was a very busy year for me and um the pink floyd has split up and i was managing roger waters in his solo career he had just finished his first solo album and we decided that he wanted to premiere it in New York. So we booked um, a run of shows at Radio City in New York, it was a very famous venue. And I was on my way to take Roger to New York. Um, Wham! Um, were another act that I worked with a lot with George Michael. Um, his manager, Simon Napier-Bell, called me up um, around about the time before I was leaving for New York and said, um, look, he said, I, I've managed to get some dates for Wham to play in China, um, but I'm not allowed to go. So can you pick them up in Hong Kong and take them on his tour to China? I said, China? He said, yes. <laughs> he said, don't worry. He said, um, I've done a deal with the all uh, the all 
youth party organization and they're going to meet you in Guangzhou. We, we're going to, you know, as you know, we're doing two concerts in Hong Kong. Pick us up in Hong Kong and then you'll have to take the band on because unfortunately I'm not allowed into China. I said, oh, great. So here am I. I'm, I, I'm now, my brain is completely addled. I've got to take Roger Waters to New York and then I've got to get from New York via Tokyo to get to Hong Kong uh, to pick up Wham and literally go to the unknown. I'd already taken Elton John some years earlier uh, to Russia to be the first Western pop group, but this was definitely the first Western pop group ever to go to China. So I was up to my neck in it. Everybody before Christmas, that Christmas, 84, was aware of those unbelievable pictures that Michael Burke was showing on television of, for the first time ever, of people starving in Africa, when the debate of the day in Europe was what to do with butter mountains, fruit mountains, and general excess food, because they hadn't figured out the common agricultural policy as yet. And there was this whole debate about destroying millions of tons of apples. And here we are, straight down 4,000 miles away admittedly but nevertheless straight down there are people who are literally starving and he just didn't add up so Bob and Midgeor got together and wrote the song Do They Know It's Christmas and got this galaxy of stars to go and record it and the record was released and um, it went straight to number one and actually made about seven million pounds which was pretty incredible. Post Christmas, um, the press were really pushing hard for Bob to go out to Africa because they wanted to film him going to Africa. And Bob didn't want to go because he didn't want to have a media circus with a backdrop of hundreds of thousands of people starving, you know, behind him. He just didn't want to do it. Anyway, he got persuaded to go. He went to Africa with a whole media crew and he realized that the money he'd raised was a, just a complete spit in the ocean. So he came back and then thought about it and just decided that he wanted to organize a concert um, to raise some more money. And he started to contact me and I said, Bob, I can't deal with this. I'm literally, I'm working with Roger Waters and then I'm off to China with Wham into, literally into the unknown. Uh, and it was the unknown. Um, I'll have a think about it when I get back. And he'd go, no, you've got to get involved in this. You've got to do it, you've got to do it, and so on and so forth. And I said, I, with all due respect, I, I, I get the whole picture. I understand it, but I can't deal with this till I get back. Off I went to Lord Roger Walters' career in New York, which thank goodness was successful at the time. Um, I then went to, uh, from New York via Tokyo um, to uh, Hong Kong, picked up Wham. We were, we got on the train, which was quite an extraordinary experience on itself, to Guangzhou. We arrive in Guangzhou and um, the one thing I remembered before they, the band all left, I phoned the tour manager up and I said, Will you please take a suitcase full of T-shirts, uh, CDs, uh, caps, whatever you can get your hand on emerge, just take it with, because after my Russia experience, it might come in handy. So we like arrive current, at the... It's like currency. Exactly. So we arrive at the border in Guangzhou, and the uh, border guards, we got off the train, and the border guards are looking at us, and there were 60 of us, and they're going, who are these people? And I go, hello, <laughs> said, I'm from England. I have this group here. We're going to play uh, uh, music in China. We're doing eight concerts in China. And hello, and where's our host? They looked at each other. A, they didn't know what I was talking about. And B, they hadn't got the foggiest idea who we are, what we were doing there, why we were there, and on what basis we should be laid into China. <laughs> So I grabbed the tour manager. I said, get the bloody suitcase out with the stuff and start <laughs> dishing out the CDs and the T-shirts, which he did, at which points they're all looking at it. And suddenly they started joking around and I want this one and he wanted the hat. And suddenly they 
then decided to let us into China. So we go through the border, we're into China, and we're standing there, and I've grouped everybody around. There's no one there. <laughs> we're it. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw two buses parked over the road, and I thought, they've got to be for us. What else? There's no one else here. So I march over, I'm going, uh, Wham Pop Group, and they're going, oh, yes. Everybody piles in the thing. I said, where are we going? Where is our host? No sign. So they take us to this hotel, very, very nice hotel in, in Guangzhou, which is Canton, the old Canton. And we check in the hotel. I said to everybody, please don't unpack. We might be out of here in the morning. This could be the fastest trip to China on record. I get to the hotel room. I'm pretty exhausted because I'm, I'm jet lagged from going to New York and then from New York to Tokyo and then Tokyo to Hong Kong and Hong Kong on a trade thing. I'm just dozing off. It is now quarter past one in the morning and the phone rings. It's my thing. They phone me at quarter past one in the morning. And it's our host. And I said, where the hell have you been? He said, good news. I said, what do you mean good news? What's happening? He said, we have permit to do concerts. I said, you mean we've all arrived here to do eight shows and it's quarter past one in the morning and we're playing the first concert tomorrow night. You just got the permit. He said, yes, 15 minutes ago. He said, come get dressed, meet me downstairs. I said, why? He said, I have to show you. So I go downstairs. I'm now so confused and bemused at the same time. I thought, I'm here, what the hell? I go downstairs, I meet this guy who's so excited, jumping up and down. He puts me in his old bone shaker. We go to the, the venue, which is a very nice venue as it happens. And I hadn't seen it before, obviously. There's Sun Yet. Yet Sen Hall, which is a very nice basketball hall. And as we're driving around, there are thousands of kids looped around the building. And I said, what the hell's going on? He said, they're queuing up for tickets. I said, it's half past two in the morning. So the jungle drums were now. Everybody knew about it. And that's how we started our tour of China. It was extraordinary. So China went off very well. It, it was a real experience. It was pretty special. I get back from China and the next morning on, I go to my office and there outside the front door is Bob waiting for me. And he said, we're going to do this concert. So he came in, we sat down, we talked about it. This was 10 and a half weeks before the event. The event. And um, we literally, we just stopped everything. I put a team of people together and we started to plan the concert. Bob was talking to um, um, the head of IMG about a TV special. Mark McCormack. Mark McCormack. And Mark McCormack said, I think I can do a deal with Channel 4 and get you two hours. So Bob was running along that route and I, he, he was a bit nonplussed about it. And I said, Bob, we have to do better than that because to do all this for two hours doesn't make any sense. I'll call the BBC. So I called Mike Appleton, who was the producer of the old Great Whistle Test and um, who's a really good friend and so on. And I said, this is what we want to do. And he said, I'll speak to the head of daytime television. So he spoke to the head of daytime television and a meeting was organized and Bob came along and smashed his hand on the table about 15 times and said, <laughs> we have to do the whole concert. And they said, what do you mean? And they said, um, 16 hours. And he said, no one's ever done 16 hours before. And most of our scheduling is already done. There's test matches. We might be able to do an hour on BBC One and a couple of hours on BBC Two, then we'll have to flip back. And he said, no, 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 no. Anyway, over to you, because they went to see you, and somehow or the other, you then approved how to do it. And the following Tuesday, um, it was approved to really give it the full coverage. That was the real start of Live Aid, because without that, the rest of it was meaningless. And so it was from that point, really, 
that the whole thing started to come together. What's the amazing, other thing, sorry, what's the, sorry to interrupt, sir, Harvey. Um, what's amazing when you get to know Bob, uh, he is a life force. Yes, a life force. And after the concert, everything, everybody's going mad. Every world leader wants to have their picture taken with Bob. They all, they all want to have a piece of Live Aid. Yeah. We're sitting in trustees meeting, deciding whether to buy trucks in the Sudan or whether we're going to hand it over to, the, to one of the aid agencies. How, and we're, we're, you know, millions and millions of pounds we're looking at here. And Bob's PA keeps coming in and saying, Bob, President Mitterrand on the phone for you. Yeah. And, and Bob says, tell him to F off, literally, tell him to F off. <laughs> now about the trucks, you know, she comes back in, uh, uh, President so-and-so, well, I'll tell him that. And then eventually he, he outlines his list of demands that he wants from these world leaders in order to be photographed. With. And it all worked. He just had an amazing ability to get people to do things that they never dreamt they ever would do. Yeah. Um, but the, the wonderful thing is that, that Harvey and I are in touch most days uh, deciding on uh, uh, proposals to spend money that's still coming in. Uh, yeah, we, get I just... fees, we get royalties. Uh, it's amazing. And, and every day there's an email comes in and Harvey and I are on the email trail saying, well, what's this? What's that? We should do this. Or it sounds a lot of money. Or And, and, and it, it's, it's a, one of the greatest events, I think, in the, in the history of television, speaking of the... Well, it, it, transformed, it transformed television. It identified oh. the value of music and television. And it also transformed the way that people gave money and, and the intention that it was. Uh, our target going in when Bob and I first talked was a million pounds. When we got to the night before the concert, um, the first thing that happened was about nine o'clock in the evening, I got a phone call from my production manager to tell me that we created this stage as a turntable stage, which had three sections. So. One band was loading on, one band was playing, and another band was loading off. So we could keep turning because we the one thing we had to do was keep absolutely strictly to time. It was vital because um, the whole thing was uh, on the broadcast of television and it went out live to 69 countries, I think. Um, and also we, we wanted to be on time to pick up uh, the show in Philadelphia, which is a whole other story. But anyway, we ended up in Philadelphia because we couldn't find a venue in New York um, uh, in a timely fashion. And so the timing was really important. Um, and on the uh, and then one of the managers phoned me up, must be at about 11 o'clock at night, and said, um, if we don't get on the main... Um, CBS broadcast in America, I'm pulling the act out. And this, while I'm doing that, I'm going to tell Mick Jagger and he can't play and this, that, and the other. I, I just got to the point at that point. I said, OK, fine, no worries, goodbye. We've got plenty of acts. Of course, they didn't. People were putting pressure on us left, right, and centre. And at about two o'clock in the morning, Bob and I uh, uh, spoke to each other and I said, I've got to get some sleep because I'm going to get up at seven. Um, and we thought, we'd probably be able to raise about five million pounds at that point. That was our target. And of course, we ended up raising over 140, which is quite extraordinary. Which, and Which, as, as, as you know, you're, you, you're getting old because a lot of your sentences end with the words, and that was a lot of money in those days. Well, it was. It was a lot. It's still it's a lot of money today, let alone those days. Yeah. Um, it, was, it caught everybody's imagination. It was the most fabulous day. I mean, you know, it was a brilliant English summer's day. So you couldn't get better than that. And then as the show progressed with all those acts, one after the other, and of course the opening with the presence of Princess Diana and, and, and Prince Charles turning up uh, made it even more special um, and so on. And then we got to that immortal queen performance which which i bob didn't actually want queen to play next time you speak to him, you ask him 
he actually didn't want them to play at all. Couldn't understand why I wanted it. I insisted on it. And in the end, he gave in. And I said, I want them to play at about five o'clock in the afternoon when it's a low period because they'll lift the audience up. And he's going, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. You know, it was like, he was so nonchalant at that point. Anyway, not only did they lift the audience up, it was this miraculous performance by Freddie and the, and, and the rest of Queen that everybody remembers to this day. It was extraordinary. And then the, 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 the bad point was we spent right up until the last week trying to persuade Paul McCartney to do it. He agreed to do it. He turns up, goes on stage, starts singing, and in the rush to get him set up, one of the road crew tripped over a lead that had led to his microphone. And of course he was singing away. No one could hear a word. And it was like, I was crying. It was just so anyway, we, we halfway through his song, we finally fixed it. And then he went on to play. So there were so many um, memories of what happened and how it all worked. Uh, and remember when we did that show, um, there were no computers, there were no mobile phones, Fax machines had just been, were being talked about, but nobody had actually seen one. So we worked off line, uh, you know, phone lines and um, telex. And telex was this ticker tape that used to come and spew out of this big machine. And then you put it into the, another part of the machine and it would come out and read this huge piece of paper that would have all the words translated from dots and blips on the, te on the telex tape. That's how we worked it. And trying to figure out where the uh, the satellites were going to be, I'm sitting with the wonderful engineers of the BBC with a map of space and a pair of calipers and a pencil, and we're using the calipers to figure out at what time the satellite should be at a certain point. That's how crude it was. It was extraordinary, really, when you Amazing. think about it. But there Amazing. you go. Amazing. The net result of... of of Live Aid was it changed the face of music and it changed the face of giving. Changing the face of music means that the media, the national media, suddenly realized that music sold papers. And so they created the cause of the celebrity, which completely transformed and changed everything. Not for the good, I might add, but pre that, the only time you ever read about a rock musician was when uh, either they were going bust or they were getting divorced. It was one of the two. That's all being, and when bust, I mean being busted for drugs. When, when, you look, when you look back, Harvey, were there any big acts that afterwards regretted that they'd said no? Um, oh, yeah, I'm sure there were. If I could, I mean, you know, Stevie Wonder, who refused to play, um, he said, I'm not going to be the token black artist, which caused us a lot of pain, actually. He then regretted it. And then he did that. Uh, we are the world show in in, uh, in um, America later. Um, there were a few artists that, that uh, said they wanted to play, didn't and then regretted it terribly. But those that did play just had a blast. And as you know, the the, the best thing the biggest stunt we pulled was Phil Collins refused point blank to play the show. Tony Smith was an ex-partner of mine and I phoned Tony up and I was said, his, man his manager, his manager. And I said, Tony, Phil's got to play the show. And he's going, oh, you know, you've got enough people. What do you want, Phil? He doesn't really want to do it. I said, ask him what he wants to play the show. And Tony called me back. Uh, one afternoon and he said well, Phil would do it but he wants to do both shows so I said okay no problem and he said oh yeah so this was the challenge thrown out to me how does he get him to play to I phoned up British Airways and I said I've got the best stunt you could ever think of Phil Collins is going to play at Wembley Stadium then you're going to let me have a concord I'll fill it with press from all over the world and you'll get a mile of publicity and then if you could possibly change your itinerary to arrive an hour later in New York, we can then get a helicopter, go straight to Philadelphia and he can play there. And they just said, great idea. Love it. Let's do it. It was just like that. I phoned Tony up and said, OK, done. All organised. 
he literally dropped the phone. He couldn't believe that. <laughs> it was like nothing to nothing to lose. So that, there, were, there were lots. Of, it, it was an extraordinary event. It, it really was, and it still goes on. And unfortunately, today, as you as you know, um, there's a huge problem going on. We we're allowed to cover this region called the Sahel region, which is Sudan, Ethiopia, Chad, Mali, Eritrea. Um, this belt across Africa, and at the moment, it's an absolute mess. And this is man-made because of problems with uh, fundamentalist Boko Haram and so on, wars going on between Eritrea and, and Mali and, um, and the government and so on. And there are hundreds of thousands of refugees, again, unfortunately, starving. So life goes around in a big circle. I just signed a check um, yesterday for £200,000 to go out for medical aid, urgent medical aid to go out. And we're fortunate, we, we don't advertise, we don't, you can't even find us if you look us up anywhere, but somehow we managed to get um, two or three million pounds every year, which we're still distributing as fast as we get it. And to all of our credit, Michael, we've never had one penny of overhead, except the fee we have to pay to have an, a legal audit. That's it. Yeah. That's the only, the only fee we've ever paid okay. out. Looking at the wonderful people who've joined us tonight, um, um, most of they, they look like a very young crowd, but one or two of them may remember Live Aid. Yes. Um, I suspect a lot of them uh, enjoy the theatre and live entertainment, yep. as well as their television. Uh, but we've had, we're in, nearly into a year and a half of no theatre. We're now struggling to get the theatres back open, and we don't know what yes. the rules are and so on all the big concerts and the, the summer music festivals are, are uh, not happening. Uh, how long is this going to go on, do you think? Are you, are you optimistic, pessimistic? No, I'm not. It's a, it's a problem. We have a fundamental issue with the government, and I find it quite amazing. They do not understand our industry. And not only do, not, do they not understand it, they refuse point blank to use the expertise that we have in our industry across the ball from security to dealing with mass audiences, to selling tickets, to marketing, to, to having talent that moves people. They refuse to do that. And they spend all their time hiring firms of consultants that know absolutely bugger all about our business. And they are trying to learn and tell us, and they don't get it. So the consequence is that there are a large number of issues that have not been resolved and are unlikely to be resolved before this summer. So the Prime Minister and the uh, Secretary of State for the DCMS got up and said, oh, yes, we're all going to be dancing and going to shows and go to the theatre. Uh, and on the 21st of June, when the government takes all the all the uh, rolls off, life's going to get back to normal, isn't it? Fabulous in all these open air shows. Hundreds of thousands of tickets were sold on that basis when he made that announcement in the anticipation of, of shows picking up again and entertainment. And people do like to go to entertainment. They love going to the theatre. They love going to opera and ballet. And they love going to concerts. Um, and unfortunately, we have no rules of engagement. We do not know what the protocols are for reopening. We don't understand what the ventilation issues are. We don't understand how to deal with it in the venues. And more importantly of all, there is no sign of any insurance even being discussed until such time as the government give the all clear that um, that all the gloves are off, which theoretically is going to be on June the 21st. Practically, it's going to be at least two to three weeks later. So that means if they're not going to um, start to discuss insurance until that announcement takes place, it is unlikely that any deal on insurance uh, across the board will be secured before September or October at the very earliest, which means the summer is a complete wipe out.
because the, for those that don't understand how business works, most of the work that is done up front, the pre-production, the rehearsals, the putting the show together, all, that's all paid for before one person arrives at the theatre. And all of the tickets that are sold are held by the box offices. They're not released to the promoter until 20 minutes after the artist has been on stage. So we have to front the money up, up front. And if, God forbid, there is a problem the day before, as happened in Australia about six weeks ago, uh, and you're not covered for insurance, you could lose five or six or eight million pounds at a drop of a hat. And we can't afford to take that risk. No. There was a festival in Australia, uh, outside Melbourne, about the set for about six weeks ago. And remember, Australia was way ahead of us and had no problems. It was a weekend fest, blues festival, 50,000 people a night for three days, completely sold out. The night before, a couple arrived in the town where the blues festival uh, takes place and were uh, tested positive uh, for the virus and the government shut the festival down. It then transpired that this couple that had pitched up to the town in Byron Bay had nothing to do with the concert, with the festival, weren't even going to it, went to see relatives, had nothing to do with anything. Nevertheless, that promoter lost $7 million there and then, and, and now is going to have to sue the government to get it back. So we can't afford to take that risk. And the final issue, believe it or not, that is really screwing us up is the issue of Europe. Because as of now, we have a major issue that we cannot truck our equipment around Europe. And secondly, well, we have a visa issue, which means that every country we go to, we have to have a new visa, which means that we've got to have to have about 15 passports. Otherwise, the whole touring itinerary just doesn't work. So between the insurance, the European issues, the trucking, which is called cabotage, and the, uh, the fact we have no protocols means we cannot properly open. The only thing that is happening is some theater uh, productions are opening up, but they're only allowed 25% of the house capacity, which unfortunately economically doesn't work for anybody, but they've decided to do that. So it's a mess. Listening, listening to that tale of woe, Harvey, I'm wondering whether you're thinking of retiring. <laughs> Well, the other issue, of course, is that some, uh, for example, we, most of our international shows play um, England and play Ireland. The government of Ireland have told us in black and white, there will not be any shows of any description before end of November at the very earliest. So that means this year has gone. So we're having to once again move tours uh, and most of us have pretty, pretty well written off both the summer and the autumn, which is a real shame. That's that's the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, last couple of questions, then we'll go to, to... Looking back on your extraordinary career, entrepreneurial, impresario, etc., who's the greatest artist you've ever promoted? Um, I think probably Pavarotti. Right. I worked with him for 26 years. We became very close friends. I managed him for the last nine years of his life. He was an extraordinary character and the world's greatest rock star, as I call him, because yeah. there wasn't there wasn't a town, there wasn't a, a, a region or a country that he that he could visit, which wouldn't sell out instantly. He had more fans around the world than any other living artist uh, and was a most extraordinary person. And uh, I love working with him. He, we were very, very close. He was an extraordinary man. And strangely enough, the one thing that when he, he got very sick um, towards the end of his life, uh, the one thing he was trying to do, he was uh, mentoring 10 students. He was really quite determined to find his successor. And even though he'd worked with, uh, with uh, Placido Domingo and Jose Carreras and they were the three tenors of whatever, 
he wanted to find his successor for the next generation. And about six weeks before he passed away, he, he told me that he said, I have these good students, but unfortunately, I have no successor. And I'm really disappointed that I haven't had the opportunity to do that. And the only other person he, he introduced to the world, but was slightly different, was Andrea Bocelli, because he, uh, he and a, a, an Italian rock star called Zucchero actually discovered Andrea Bocelli and, and really introduced him to the world. And I work very closely with Bocelli now, and he's the closest, but that's what he wanted to do. He lived very happily putting on a concert with Bono and Eric Clapton, playing with him as he did playing at the Royal Opera House. An extraordinary man. So he was, he's probably my number one. A great choice, a surprising choice. I didn't realize you had that association. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I've really, I've spent my life, um, I'm called a rock impresario, but actually half of my life is spent really on general entertainment. So I'm just as comfortable you know, presenting the three tenors, working with Pavarotti, working with Bocelli, working with orchestras, as I have done for many, many years, uh, as I am doing, you know, the Led Zeppelin reunion or working with the Stones or, 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 or um, you know, currently working um, with Bocelli and so on. And I love discovering new, new people, new ideas, new things. So um, I first heard about Bruce Springsteen in, 1973 I was in New York he was the opening act in a club downtown New York and a friend of mine who was a journalist uh, I bumped into him in the street and he said if you're not doing anything tonight go down to the bottom line there's an act playing forget about the headliner just go and see the opening act he's only going to play 20 minutes so if you're going to go go see him it's the best thing I've ever seen I went down and there were 40 people in the room it was Bruce Springsteen playing. I just was so blown away. And I went backstage and I said, I introduced myself and I said, I'm the biggest promoter in England. Ha, ha, ha. And so you have to come to England. And he looked at me, he said, this is the first time we've played New York. <laughs> it's, it took me two more years to get him over to come over in 1975, by which time he was on the front pages of both time and life. And it was, it was miraculous. And he, he is an extraordinary yeah. um, artist. And, and so it goes on. And so the same, I was, um, a friend of mine called me up and said, there's a circus playing on Santa Monica Pier. Can you get yeah. on a plane and come and see it? And I said, a circus? He said, they said, it's so unusual. You're going to love it. So I got on the plane and I, this is my thing. If somebody tells me, so I go and see it. I go and see the circus, which was Cirque du Soleil. And I worked with them for nearly 30 years. Now they do it themselves. And, uh, it took me two years to persuade the Royal Albert Hall that we could actually put a circus on there. That's not really a circus. And it's been there ever since and, and always sells out and so on. And things like that, something, things that are different, wrestling as uh, my brother will who is still involved with wrestling um Sidney Lauper who was a friend of mine and someone I knew well in America and had worked with she did a video um with a very famous wrestler called Hulk Hogan and I was in New York and her agent and manager were there we went to I meet mean, Sidney she said you're going to come and meet Hulk Hogan and I said great Hulk Hogan turned me on to what was in the World Wrestling Federation, it's now the WWE, and said, you, you've got to do something. I came back, I spoke to Sky TV, who um, I was very friendly with, and they said, yeah, they, they had heard about it and they were looking at it. Are you going to bring it over live? And I said, if you put it on TV, I'll bring it over live. And so they did. And at the time, the... WWF Wrestling and The Simpsons were the only unique programs that Sky or B Sky B had at the time. And it was huge. So I, you know, something else I worked with them for and set them up around the world. And then, um, you know, there was this Irish dancing phenomenon that happened on the Eurovision TV. And out of it came two things. One was Riverdance that played it. And then the lead of Riverdance, Michael Flatley, 
left and came to me and said, I want to do my own show. And I've got this story I want to tell called Lord of the Dance. And um, I set that up for him as well and took that round the world. And again, that was quite an extraordinary phenomenon. So I love finding all these new things. And then more recently, finally, was working with Hans Zimmer um, uh, uh, because Jeffrey Katzenberg called me up and said, we're going to launch, we're doing the premiere, believe it or not, of Kung Fu Panda 2, which is a huge movie. And this chap called Hans Zimmer, who I'd heard of, has written the music. Do you think you could do a concert with him? So I said, yeah, why not? So we did. We became friends. It took me two years to persuade him to go on tour because he'd never done it before. And we then started, we played 100 concerts and he's coming back next year. So it, again, man. always looking for someone different. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal talent, Hans yeah, Zimmer. Phenomenal. I mean, he did um, uh, Gladiators. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah, yeah. Just endless. And The Lion King. The Lion King, yeah. Anyhow, Harvey, that's a wonderful uh, trip through a little bit of your career, uh, an absolutely astonishing career. The fact that you're still smiling after taking all that punishment <laughs> over the years uh, from these rock... I think actors are bad enough, but dealing with yes. rock and their managers and their entourages... Uh, uh, is is a tribute to your resistance. You, Michael, you know, um, as we work and, and you're putting on theatrical productions with stars and I'm putting on concerts with stars, they're people, they're doing a job. Yeah. So our, our attitude towards them is not that they're stars. They may be a bit of a pain, but we, they're doing a job and they have to do their job well. And our job is to give them the tools to do their job well. So we've got, we've it's got, not difficult, is it? No, we've got time for two or three quick quick questions and quick answers, if I may. Jeremy, okay. Freeman, Jeremy Freeman asks, what performer has or had the most talent? I think you've almost answered that, but... Uh, Too many. I, 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 mean, mean, I mean, look, if you look at... the you, This is the other thing that, again, railing against the government and the DCMS, who are actually a national disgrace they don't really appreciate the talent that we have created in the uk particularly contemporary talent we had the finest artists in the world we have the finest technicians in the world that go with it people are in huge demand it's the same as making films film production in the uk is bigger than anywhere else in the world currently and they don't get it they don't understand what we what we do and how much income we bring into the country. So um, there is some amazing talent around, and um, they're just not they're not getting recognition from government and allowed to work. That's the problem. Okay. Uh, question from Paul Scott: How do you think live stream performances will impact the music world, even after the world returns to normal from COVID? Do you think streaming? Yeah, live streaming is here to stay. And funnily will enough, replace, will it replace live performance? Cut the no. actual experience of going to the concert. No, you cannot. You cannot replace the experience of a group of people who have all come to see their hero, all being in a room together, and the their hero, the band or the artist performing to them in front of them. You cannot beat that experience. No, you cannot true. beat the experience of going to the theatre and. Absolutely. work at the Colosseum of theatre, people. Theatre survived everything. The advent of movies, exactly. talkies, television, the you internet. You can't beat the experience. Streaming, DVDs, you name it. The, the, the experience of sitting in the dark, watching the talent is something else. Now, that streaming, maybe, I'll just finish off the yeah, streaming Please, bit. please. Uh, streaming is definitely here to stay. It is not quite right yet. There's a number of issues with streaming. Um, uh, those of you that wanted to, to watch Glastonbury the other week, um, a large number of the audience, they did a special event for Glastonbury that was streamed, couldn't see it because there was a glitch in the setup and the operation. We're not quite there yet with how to do it. Okay. The second no, issue sorry. about streaming, I'll just finish again. The second sorry, issue sorry, about Harry. streaming is the sound quality. Sound quality on your phone or on a laptop is appalling. So we have to try and figure out how to deal with that. 
yeah. And the last bit is the visual stream because it takes up so much bandwidth, which as much as we all think how wonderful technology is, it doesn't actually work. It's a complete screw up. Every day of the week where I live, I live in Maribone, my office is around the corner from the BBC. I would think at least three to four times a day, the internet goes down. It may go down for a second or a minute or whatever, but it goes down. We are not ready to take into account the technology. We don't know how it works properly. Harvey, have you tried paying the subscriptions for the? I did try, yeah, yeah. I did try. That sometimes works. I know it sometimes that. works, but but here's here's the last question from Gil Carpus to everyone. I I remember a Wham interview after the China gig. And they said that dancing wasn't allowed in the aisles and getting paid was difficult, but they were offered bicycles as payment. Is that true or was it a joke? Uh, Gil was nine at the time and, and, and of course believed it when, when they told that story. Did they get paid? Did you get paid in bicycles? We didn't get paid in bicycles, but we were offered bicycles as part of the payment solution. That is actually <laughs> true. The uh, dancing in aisles, um, at the first concert we had, which was in Guangzhou, um, there were more um, Chinese guards and police in the room than there were people. But what had happened was that Simon Napier Bell, the WAM's manager, had somehow managed to arrange, you remember at that point, Hong Kong was still British, um, uh, had managed to arrange about 200 Hong Kong WAM fanatics to actually manage to get either get on the train or drive to Guangzhou and manage to get into the concert. And what happened was they all got up and rushed the uh, stage as they do. The guards panicked and really got in a terrible mess. And I explained to them beforehand and whatever. And we had the usual problem that we have a lot in that the dignitaries that came to the concert because they wanted to see what it was all about, of course, insisted on sitting at the front. And I kept explaining to the, uh, the head of the police, it wasn't a good idea for them to sit at the front. And they go, no, 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 they have to sit at the very front. I go, no, no, they shouldn't do. We will create, we'll build them a royal box. The royal box is always on the side. And they go, why? I said, because if they sit in the front row, they will spend the whole evening like this and they will have kids because it's so loud. It, it took me half a day, half of the day to explain to them that it wasn't a good idea to have the regional governor and the minister of propaganda sitting in the front row because they'll get you know, pushed over by kids. And we finally managed to build a royal box on the side to put all the dignitaries in. So that allowed a bit of excitement for the concert. And of course, George and Andrew did their very best to do everything to entice the audience down, have a good time and, and everything. So we managed, we got through it, but it was very difficult at first. Last, this is positively the last question because there are one or two hungry faces, I think haven't eaten yet. Deliveroo hasn't arrived or is <laughs> um, uh, uh, Is there a, a massive warehouse somewhere with all your memorabilia and all the precious <laughs> souvenirs that you've collected over the years, or do you junk? Do you not look back and junk it all? Because if, if my you, had, the, the, had Harvey, one. the Harvey Goldsmith Museum has a certain ring to it, I think. Well, I do chair the Rock and Roll Museum, right. which is in Liverpool. It's in the Cunard Building, which is one of the three Graces, the middle of the three Grace Buildings on the dockside. That is called the British Music Experience. That is, if you ever get up to Liverpool, please go and see it, because that tells the history of contemporary music from 1945 to today. And Brilliant. that's a fantastic experience. Um, if my wife had her way, uh, I would have a completely clean, nothing house, but I do have my secret warehouse, where, which is stuffed to the brim with uh, memorabilia and in fact I just auctioned some stuff at Bonhams just to see what it was about it was quite interesting um, yeah I've got tons and tons and tons of stuff well on behalf of the audience I hope uh, 
I hope you'll go on collecting and I hope you'll go on collecting memories that you can share with us at a future day. For me, it's been a particular pleasure uh, having Thanks this chat with, yeah. with my, my dear friend Harvey. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for supporting the two causes tonight. Uh, support live music, support JMI, support Malcolm, support all the causes. Thank wow, you, so Harvey. And thank you. Thank you for ask, Thank you for asking us. All my love to everybody. Many old friends out there. Many uh, old faces. Uh, many new faces, and uh, one or two new faces on old faces. But let's not go there. Bless you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael and Harvey. Jen, I think you'd wanted to just say a few words. Well, I just, I'm sitting here. Michael, I know well, we grew up in the same village, but Harvey, I could listen for the next 10 years, the Live Aid and Cirque du Soleil, which I took my kids to, and I absolutely adored. And I went to Vegas when I was working and listened. The stories behind the scenes, I grew up with a very famous barber and hearing music in the background. But the stories of big, amazing, wonderful work that you've done, I'm humbled. I'm humbled at what you do, um, at your friendship, both of you, with what you've contributed. Also, I wish that people in government and anywhere would understand the value of joy and music and lifting hearts. I'm very humbled and Harvey, I have to meet you to say hi personally, because your stories are incredible. And I wish you bis hundreds fansig, both of you, and thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very much indeed. And I'd be very happy to meet with you. Great. Yeah. Thank you, That's guys. Good. And send your wife my best, Michael. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. So good. Thank you. Not this good, no. No. And Harry Morgan's is closed, you know, it's not been... I know. <laughs> what are you doing eating there when it's not kosher? <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining on, on behalf of the JMI and, and the Malky Foundation. Uh, thank you again. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone soon and looking forward to the next events. And um, take care and good night.